Okay, Ling201, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be the last lecture of the semester. Uh, so to make the most of it, um, I'm dressed a little less formally to sort of celebrate the Bermuda Shorts Day that we're all going to miss this semester. Uh, also, right on cue for the last uh, lecture of the semester, we got a little bit of snowstorm uh, happening outside. So uh, everything's lined up uh, just right, um, even though, oops, that's not what I wanted to do at all. Um, never mind. Uh, <laughs> As soon as I say things are lined up right, I screw something up. But anyways, today we're going to talk about lexical semantics. Uh, again, uh, we're going to kind of wrap up that bit of um, the semantics module. And then I'm going to say a few things about language preservation at the uh, very end. Uh, and with that in mind, the quick write for this lecture is on language death, um, which is an unfortunately increasing phenomenon in the current day and age. Uh, and this is also kind of one of the more interesting quick writes for me to read the answers to. So I'd appreciate it if you could send these in uh, right about the same time that you um, send in your semantics homeworks because I'm interested to know what you think about the answer to this question. Okay, so give that a shot uh, before you watch this lecture or um, during or after or whenever. Uh, and let's get into it. So um, a couple of lectures ago, I talked about the correspondence theory of truth. Uh, which is the idea that um, we have propositions and they can correspond to uh, the reality of the world around us. Um, so they have either uh, a truth value of true or false. So truth is the correspondence of propositions to facts is a nice way to kind of summarize that theory. Um, and in the past, uh, some students have uh, kind of rightly uh, objected that this is maybe an oversimplification, which it kind of is because you can have, um, say, well, it's a question of like, what exactly do you mean by the world of objective facts? How do we know exactly that a proposition matches up with the way the world actually is? Um, and to a certain extent, there are objective truths in the world that we can all pretty much agree on. And then there are also subjective truths about the world. So, um, for instance, a subjective truth would be if you say it's chilly outside. Now, right now it's snowing, so I think most people would agree that it's chilly outside or maybe even cold. Um, however, when uh, I utter statements like this, my wife and I, for instance, would not always agree about whether or not it's chilly or if it's too hot, so on and so forth. I'm sure you have disagreements with people you know about whether it's hot or cold because this is based on a subjective experience of the temperature outside. Um, not only based on who you are, but how you're feeling on a particular day and how you're dressed, so on and so forth. Uh, we can compare that to an objective fact like the Boston Bruins won the Stanley Cup in 2011 which is true, you can look it up, uh, which is a fact that's based on all sorts of specific criteria about things that actually happen in the world and can't really be contested uh, so long as somebody keeps a record of what actually happened, right? That is something that actually happened, so it's something we can all basically agree on. Um, so uh, you can maybe think about this um, in this way that subjective truths can be true, but only from one person's perspective, while I was Whereas um, objective truths are true from all possible perspectives, from everybody's perspective, as it were. Um, so there's a difference between objectivity and subjectivity there, which I'm kind of trying to lead into um, the superior wharf hypothesis with. So this is something you may have heard of before. So these are um, this is a hypothesis that came from the early 20th century uh, when linguistics was, uh, linguistics was more of a subfield of anthropology than it was its own sort of branch of science as it is now. Uh, and uh, there were two influential linguists at the time, uh, Edward Sapir and his student Benjamin Worf, uh, who made the following proposal um, that a person's conception of reality is dependent upon the language that they speak. So uh, I guess I'll add some more information about that. So in the early 20th 20th century tradition uh, of anthropological linguistics uh, in which Sapir and Worf were, were trained and worked, uh, they uh, had more of a focus on going out and sort of just documenting the languages that um, were spoken in um, different societies or cultures, uh, more with an emphasis on not only just providing a documentary record of what um, the culture was doing and how the language worked, but also focusing maybe a little bit more on what made that culture or language unique. Um, with respect to all the other languages in the world, um, while still trying to figure out how they all sort of interrelated. So Edward Sapir and Benjamin Worf did a lot of work on um, the uh, indigenous languages of the Americas, for instance, uh, and came up with schemes to try to figure out how they were all related to one another. But there wasn't sort of the emphasis that we have in contemporary linguistics about trying to sort of 
dig into the universal commonalities amongst all languages and trying to figure out what universal grammar is all about. Um, there wasn't sort of that mindset in the sort of um, program of research that they were conducting at the time. Instead, um, they developed this kind of interesting idea. And like I said, this is the early 20th, 20th century. So this is about 100 years ago when Edward Sapir said the following, human beings do not live in the objective world alone nor in the world of social activity as ordinarily understood, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. We see and hear and otherwise experience very largely as we do because the language habits of our community predispose certain choices of interpretation. So uh, to take like an extreme example of this, you might think, well, right now it's kind of an objective fact that it's snowing outside, at least the way I think about it. Uh, so you might be perceiving that differently depending on what language you speak um, and what your conception of snow is, if Sapir is correct. Uh, Benjamin Worf later on, like I said, he was a Sapir student. So in the 50s, he wrote, the background linguistic system, in other words, the grammar of each language is not merely the reproducing instrument for voicing ideas, but rather is itself the shaper of ideas, the programming guide for the individual's mental activity, for his analysis of impressions, for his synthesis of his mental stock and trade. We dissect nature along lines laid down by our native languages. <clears throat> so uh, these are interesting thoughts, kind of compelling ideas, but they're hard to prove in reality. Uh, and I've had students in the past ask me if I believe in this, and in my gut I would say I don't because I can feel pretty strongly that there is an objective world out there that we can all rely on and kind of get the same experiences out of. Uh, but I will say that one place, at least in my research uh, and studies, ha that I've clearly found that this sort of superior wharf hypothesis really does hold true uh, is in the um, domain of speech perception. Uh, so this is maybe a little bit of a cheat, but when you perceive speech, when you perceive what a certain person is saying, that <clears throat> what your experience of what that person is saying is largely shaped by your knowledge of um, your own native language and to a certain extent your knowledge of the language they're speaking as well. You really can't get around it. Um, your mind's going to tell you what it thinks uh, a person is saying based on what is meaningful in your own language. And the reason I'm saying that's maybe a little bit of a cheat is because we might not think of that as um, objective and reality, objective reality in the same way that you know you can see a house or you can see that it's snowing outside, that sort of thing. And it's linguistically related as well um, because you're having to sort of rely on your knowledge of language to interpret language uh, when you encounter it in another speaker. But it's very uh, robust. You can really, it's extremely difficult to get beyond your native language biases when you're listening to somebody else speak. Um, so I'll go in another direction beyond that, which is that uh, we can look at something a little bit more objective and look at, say, the way that languages organize the color spectrum uh, and what sort of interesting differences we can find there. So. What I mean by the color spectrum is this sort of rainbow palette of colors here. <clears throat> Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet is the way I learned it. <clears throat> Sorry, get a little bit of water here. Um, when I was in school. Uh, but this is an interesting um, sort of pattern of colors because we can define it objectively. So it's based on actually the frequency of electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> going from the red end of the spectrum to the uh, purplish end of the spectrum over here. There's a continuity underlying this that we can define in absolute physical terms, but the way we perceive it um, as human beings, just our optical system kind of divides it up into different colors. It's not strictly continuous the way we see it, but then there's also a linguistic way to kind of divide this thing up. Uh, so like I said in um, English, uh, this is the way I would divide it up, red, orange, yellow, green, blue purple, this is the way I learned the sort of mnemonic uh, for this. So I'm reading it from right to left, but if you want to, you can read it from left to right too. But there are six colors in there. Um, maybe you see more, but that's how I divide it up for English. Uh, and so there are other languages though that uh, make further distinctions. So like Hungarian apparently distinguishes between piros and voros, between I guess a light red and a dark red, which is not the same thing. The light red is I guess not orange. Uh, and then Russian, distinguishes between like a dark blue sine and a light blue goloboy. Uh, so somewhere over here, and you can kind of see how that would work too, right? So this is maybe not the exact same color as that. Um, yeah, but then there's a, languages that go in the other direction and they have fewer distinctions in here than we have in English. So an example is from Shona. 
which is a language spoken in Zimbabwe in the southern region of Africa. Uh, so in Shona, you have um, Sitema, which means something like blue, Sisena, which means something like green, uh, then Sipsuka and Sipsuka on either ends of the spectrum. So it kind of wraps around for speakers of this language where red and purple are kind of pretty much the same thing. Uh, but then you make distinctions over here in the middle. Um, but there's no strict term for yellow. Uh, so, uh, or a color like that. Um, and this is actually something I encountered when I was in an undergrad way back in the day. Uh, we had a field methods class uh, where we had a uh, speaker of Shona and every um, time we met, we would just kind of bring in um, questions for him to say, like, how do you say these things in Shona? Uh, and then we kind of write down what he said and try to figure out how the language works that way. And I do remember asking him um, uh, what was the word for yellow in Shona at some point. And he thought a long time about it and just couldn't come up with anything for it. I uh, just kind of drew a blank, which to me was just totally beyond my experience, uh, but not his, right? So his mind is processing uh, this color spectrum in a totally different way. Um, yeah, and there's also a more extreme example. Uh, this is a language called Basa, which is spoken in Ivory Coast. Uh, so or Cote d'Ivoire, I guess is how we're supposed to say it. But it has two, um, Color terms to us, hui on this end and has ziza on the red end. Uh, and this, I don't know exactly where it gets divided up here in the middle, but um, it encompasses sort of a broader range of colors for each one of these terms than we would um, put together uh, in a language like English. So different languages can divide this up in different ways. Um, and there's a famous study from about 50 years ago uh, that was run by a couple of anthropologists named Brent Berlin and Paul Kay. Uh, and they cataloged the color terms of 98 different languages. So the way they did this is they got a um, big array of color chips like you might find at um, a paint store. Uh, and they went around the world just presenting speakers of different languages with this array of color chips um, to try to get them to say like what each chip um, corresponds to, what word each chip corresponds to in their language. So they had different tasks. So for each color word, word in the speaker's language, uh, they were supposed to call, uh, circle all the chips that it applied to. And then also they wanted them, them to circle the chip that is the best example of a particular color uh, in their language. And they found some interesting and pretty consistent results. So every language that they studied has at least two basic color terms. So like um, one color term meaning dark or black and another color term meaning light or white. Uh, and Basa might be an example of a two color language like this. Um, if a language has a third color term, um, then the one it's going to add is red. Uh, and if it has a fourth color term, it's going to add either green or yellow to this. And it's consistent across linguistically, the order in which these things get added. Um, so the fifth one would be whatever one they don't pick for the fourth color term. So our basic colors are basically dark, or sorry, black, white, red, green, yellow. Where do they go after that? Sixth color term is blue. Um, I was reading not too long ago a uh, paper about uh, ancient Greek. So there's some famous passage from uh, ancient Greek literature where uh, I don't remember who, but they're talking about the wine dark sea. Uh, and the reason they were talking about the wine dark sea is because Greek didn't really have a color term for blue. Um, and we normally think about the ocean as blue, but they did not. Uh, and if you want to add another color term beyond that, you get brown. And then there's others like purple, pink, orange, and gray. And here's where the uh, sort of hierarchy starts to break down a little bit. But these first seven are fairly consistent. Um, yeah, so the big picture is that different languages divvy up the color spectrum in different ways. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me. There are still language universal patterns in the types of color schemes available to languages. So this is the overarching pattern that as linguists we kind of want to be interested in because we're trying to figure out what is universal about language. So as linguists, we want to know what competent speakers of language need to know in order to produce meaningful utterances in that language, uh, like say the semantic features of a language. Um, and we also want to be able to figure out what's language specific about a particular language and also what's language universal and we can find in any language that anybody speaks. Um, so as in syntax, whatever is language universal in the semantic features we can look at can be attributed to our innate mental endowment for language and thought. Okay, so um, I mentioned this in the last lecture. I'm just going to have put this slide up here as a bit of review. So for all languages, the semantic content of particular words can be broken down into semantic features. Uh, so we saw this with like the feature female. So like mare, hen, woman, like all these describe female 
animals of some sort. Um, we have this feature go for different verbs like fly, walk, run, and crawl, etc. And then we also talked about different types of nouns. So some nouns are count nouns and some nouns are mass nouns like coins versus change, that sort of thing. Um, beyond semantic features though, uh, the relationships, the meaning relationships between words can be um, studied at a sort of more fuzzy level or more um, subtle relationships exist when we look at how words are connected with one another. So it's, it would be nice if everything kind of broke down into like these matrices where we had specific features which, which define exactly what a word means. Uh, but that's gonna kind of miss some of the connections that we can um, observe fairly easily when we look at um, how people process words semantically. So for instance, there's a phenomenon known as semantic priming where when we hear one word, it can make us subconsciously think of other words with related meanings. Uh, and this is what the previous quick write was about, where he did the little word association, association task um, with or without a partner. Um, this is an example from um, the language files textbook where it shows you kind of a semantic network of words that are um, basically medical terms like doctor, surgeon, nurse, nurse, patient, I guess. This is very appropriate uh, for the current situation in which we find ourselves. Uh, but all of these words have some relationship to each other meaning wise. It's easy to kind of go from doctor to heart surgeon and from heart surgeon to heart to blood, so on and so forth. So these are kind of more closely connected here because they're about the circulatory system in the body. And these are kind of connected as well because they're about people who work at hospitals, uh, even though they might not be as closely related to one another as they are within each network. Um, so this is where this word association task data comes in. I'm going to give you some examples of the data I got from the class that uh, did this 10 years ago now. Uh, so you may have noticed that uh, one of the two primes were the words war and treaty. What word do you think of if somebody says war and treaty? Uh, you get a lot of peace, uh, battle, etc. Canada. Um, these are closely related because a treaty ends a war. So you get sort of consistent patterns in how people respond to those. Uh, there's other um, pairs which were not so closely related semantically, so party and treaty. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of consistency here in the responses like group and politics, alcohol, America, birthday, so on and so forth. So some of these um, kind of random uh, Responses here are going to be more related to party like birthday or party hat and others are going to be related more to like treaty like government or legislation so on and so forth. Uh, one person put tea here, which maybe who knows that was about the Boston Tea Party uh, and then like war and kitchen are not clearly related semantically. This is kind of funny because a couple people put down Gordon Ramsay, which is maybe the intersection of those two things uh, or like food fight that sort of thing, but otherwise uh, this is just a bunch of random uh, words almost um, related to one or the other, other of these things, uh, like Thanksgiving, rolling pin. Um, but otherwise, these aren't that closely related semantically, um, whereas these would be. Um, so semantic priming uh, can be studied pretty easily in the lab. Uh, one task you can use or kind of, kind of take advantage of sem semantic priming uh, to understand how words are semantically related to one another is what's called a lexical decision task. So uh, for instance, uh, let's say I'm just gonna plop up um, a sequence of letters in front of you and you have to tell me um, whether that is a word or not a word. Uh, so for instance, if you see the string of letters doctor, you'd say, okay, that's, yeah, that's a word. If it was instead doc dob or something, then you'd say, no, that's not a word. Um, but the funny thing is that if I put this word doctor in front of you and you make this decision, if you've just seen the word nurse, you can do that a lot more accurately and a lot more quickly than if you've just seen the word butter, which really isn't related to doctor in any obvious way um, in the semantic domain. Uh, you can also do this for word naming. So if instead of just deciding whether doctor is a word or not, I have you actually read this word out loud. If I show you the word nurse and then show you this one, you can say doctor a lot more quickly than if you've just seen the word butter. There is also a phenomenon, uh, and this is something that we used to talk about when I was a kid. I don't know if kids these days still do this, but it's still kind of interesting to think about. Uh, so the legend was uh, when I was young that when you were watching TV that the people who ran the TV stations 
would sometimes put subliminal advertising up there. So like for a split split second, um, they would put you know some uh, logo of something they wanted you to buy on the screen, and it happened. It went by so quickly that you um, couldn't really consciously notice that it was there, but your mind would start wanting to like buy a Coke or something like that. Um, turns out. Uh, I don't think that was actually happening on TV. I don't have any reason to believe that, but this effect is legit. Uh, you can get subliminal um, effects in these tasks uh, based on semantic priming. So if I show the word nurse to you at a very um, subliminal means subconscious, uh, one level at which you can't consciously know what you like were seeing there, what word uh, was being presented to you, uh, but it will still have an effect on response times in these tasks where you'll be able to say, uh, verify that doctor is a word more quickly if you if you've subliminally seen subliminally seen the word nurse before it um, even though you don't know what word uh, was there it went by so fast so uh, that's another way in which uh, linguistics is improving the world um, through better and more dangerous advertising so I will point out um, there's lots of work that's done on this there is a website here called WordNet, which is run by Princeton, um, that gives you sort of networks of uh, word meanings. And you can check that out if you want to. But basically, it'll generate um, little networks that look like this. So this is trying to show you uh, what sort of semantic network we can get for the word happy. Um, so happy has synonyms like glad or cheerful or so on and so forth. And it also, sh also shows you um, antonyms in the same network. So sad is an antonym of uh, these words, which is where you get these red connections, or unhappy is an antonym of happy, so on and so forth. And you can kind of go all around the uh, lexical world that way, figuring out how different words are related to one another or how closely they are related to one another semantically. Um, okay, so this also, the idea of subliminal Perception uh, leads me to the idea of presuppositions, which is sort of similar. Um, so presuppositions, um, the meaning of particular expressions depends on the existence of presuppositions. So if you think about expressions like Santa Claus is asleep right now or John stopped beating his wife, <clears throat> there are certain things that have to be true about the world in order for statements like these to make some sense. So if I say Santa Claus is asleep right now, that might be a little bit odd, but one thing that that presupposes is that there is a Santa Claus somewhere, and then it's possible for him to either be asleep or awake. Or if I say John stopped beating his wife, um, the stopped part of this presupposes that John at some point was beating his wife and now he's no longer doing it. So I'm kind of getting a second thought in there, a second assertion into this statement uh, in addition to um, declaring whatever sort of change is happening to it. Uh, so these are presuppositions. Uh, you can define them as necessary conditions for a statement to be either true or false. Uh, and you can use these again in things like advertising. So if you ask somebody like, have you had your daily vitamins? Or I used to think it was my fault that windows didn't work properly. Um, you can kind of think about it. What's the presupposition here? Well, it's that there are such things as daily vitamins that you should be taking on a regular basis. Or um, if you say, I used to think it was my fault that windows didn't work properly. There is a presupposition here that windows doesn't work properly. Um, whether or not the listener actually believes in that. Uh, and I've got this um, maybe funny example of how this could be used in court. Like, how did he know that the defendant bought a knife? Um, this is presupposing or kind of also asserting that the defendant bought a knife at some point. And I don't know for a fact that you could actually say such a thing in court without getting in trouble for it. But um, if you did, it would be involving a presupposition. You'd be putting sort of a thought in the listener's minds by doing so. So presupposition can be used to just assert ideas without stating them explicitly, pretty sneakily. Um, okay, uh, just kind of wrapping up what I want to say about uh, semantics. We've talked heretofore about um, the literal meaning of sentences, uh, but of course, as a lot of you will recognize, there are many expressions in language which uh, have meanings that are not based on the literal meanings of their words. So uh, these 
this is an example of what you might um, say is non-compositional meaning. Um, these are effectively idiomatic expressions that we get in languages. All languages of the world have them. So in English, we could say he had to eat crow uh, or she put her foot in her mouth. If this happened, if you say this, you're not probably describing um, somebody who's actually putting her foot in her mouth, <coughs> her foot in her mouth um, instead of your, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm describing somebody who uh, has some, said something mistakenly, so on and so forth, bite your tongue. Um, don't actually bite your tongue, just like don't say that particular thing. Break a leg, good luck on the stage, but don't actually break a leg, please. Uh, so literal and figurative meaning, or literal versus idiomatic meaning, they let their hair down, I've been meaning to give you peace of my mind, don't put the cart, cart before the horse. All of these could be interpreted in some literal fashion, but we almost virtually never use them in that fashion. They have some sort of idiomatic meaning uh, that we've learned to associate with them over time. Often sort of based on the literal meaning, but um, not the exact same thing. Yeah, so the one thing that's interesting about these idiomatic expressions is that they don't behave syntactically the same way that um, expressions with the literal meaning do. So I can give you an example like that old man gave me a dirty book and I can change the complement order uh, in that particular statement to say that old man gave a dirty book to me. Uh, but you could also say that old man gave me a dirty look and you could switch that one around and say that old man gave a dirty look to me. Uh, and I don't think this one's as acceptable as the original one is, um, which is using sort of that standard order for that idiomatic expression. So a dirty look is not literally some look that has dirt on it, right? It just, he's looking kind of nastily at you um, and you can't flip that around and still get the same idiomatic meaning for it. So the meaning of idioms simply has to be learned on a case by case basis through experience. And that's probably, those meanings are probably stored in something like the mental lexicon, except it's gonna look a little bit different than the lexicon we thought about at the beginning of the semester where we just have individual words and their meanings um, stored in our minds. These are individual expressions that we have to learn. And as you know, if you've uh, ever studied a foreign language, you have to learn these as you go um, get deeper into the language. So I've got some examples here of uh, idiomatic expressions that uh, kind of translate across languages, but they're expressed differently um, in different languages. Uh, and sometimes this can get kind of fun. So in English, we say that dog's bark is worse than its bite. Uh, I've encountered a Spanish speaker who told me that the dog that barks doesn't bite. Basically the same idea, slightly different expression. Uh, it's a small world in English and German. They say how small the world is. Um, you can talk about burning your bridges in English or maybe crossing the Rubicon. So crossing the Rubicon is based on a um, moment in Roman history when Julius Caesar was marching into Rome to try to sort of establish himself as emperor and he crossed the river the Rubicon, which uh, military leaders were never supposed to do. So as soon as he did that, he was kind of just um, going for it, right? Uh, it was now or never, either he succeeded or he'd be destroyed and eventually, of course, he succeeded. Um, and apparently there was a similar situation in Chinese history at some point uh, where in Chinese they say break the walks and sink the boats because uh, so whatever military commander that was trying to do the same thing um, basically did this and then marched on to victory. Uh, and sorry, I don't know that story quite as well as my Roman history. Uh, you can say that's dumb luck in English and I kind of like this one, but in German they say the dumbest farmers have the thickest potatoes. Uh, ain't that the truth? So um, this is why it's fun to study different languages. Uh, they look at things in a slightly different way, uh, and which is why it's also sad, if it weren't sad enough already, that um, the world experiences uh, what we call language death. So I've got a little screenshot here of a gravestone over in England, which um, memorializes somebody named Dorothy Pentreath who died in 1777. Uh, and um, according to this at least, was supposed to have been the last speaker of the Cornish language, um, which was a Gaelic language, which is spoken in the area of Cornwall in England, which is uh, kind of in that little Southwestern corner of the island. Um, so that happened over 200 years ago. Uh, that language faded away once she was gone. Um, and that's an example of language death. So. Language death 
is what occurs when a language is no longer being acquired as a native language and is also no longer used by whatever native speakers may still be around. Um, so many languages have died throughout history. So Cornish is one example. Etruscan, speaking of Roman history, Etruscan is the language that was spoken in um, Ro the Rome area in Italy uh, before the Romans arrived. Uh, nobody knows anything about it anymore because it's gone. Um, I'm going to contrast language death in this sense with uh, what happened to languages like Latin or Sanskrit. So Latin was the language of the Roman Empire, but wound up, um, number one, surviving in um, sort of a liturgical domain because it's still used as the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but also it um, morphed for the common people into different languages in Europe. They're all called the Romance languages now because Roman, Romance, that sort of thing. So Spanish is sort of a descendant of Latin. It's what it became in the area of Spain. And French is what Latin became in France. Italian is what it became in Italy, so on and so forth. Something similar happened in India, where um, there was a language Sanskrit, which was widely spoken. Uh, and that became uh, all the various different, well, not all the various different Indian languages, but many of them. So languages like Hindi and Gujarati and Bengali, so on and so forth, are descended from Sanskrit from a few thousand years ago. Uh, it's just what the language eventually changed into. Um, I mentioned there can also be dialect death. So certain varieties of language can um, be phased out and never heard from again. Uh, there is something like that going on uh, in the United States on the East Coast. Uh, there are some interesting, very unique dialects of American English. Uh, so for instance, um, there's on the East Coast, uh, there are these little islands. Um, sort of right on the Atlantic coast. Uh, for example, there's one called Ocracoke Island, which is at the end of a long chain of islands called the Outer Banks on the North Carolina coast. Uh, and Ocracoke Island is kind of the hardest island to get to, at least traditionally in the past. Uh, and so the people who lived there were pretty isolated from everybody else in uh, the North Carolina area. And they, uh, because they just talked amongst themselves and because they came from a specific part of England back in the day, uh, they had this unique dialect that nobody else spoke. Um, and now is kind of being faded out uh, because th they're becoming more interconnected with the outside world and people are just less prone to uh, speak in the old fashioned way. Um, Tangier Island is another example of that. I believe that's between um, Virginia and the uh, Delmarva Peninsula. Uh, but these dialects are fading out as um, American English is kind of becoming more uniform. Uh, so dialects can die off in that way as well. Uh, there are different types of language death. Um, so there's one um, which is kind of the worst of all, which is called sudden language death, where all the speakers of language die or are killed. Uh, so apparently this is what happened in Tasmania when the European settlers uh, finally made their way down to Tasmania, south of um, the little southern island of Australia. Uh, there's another example of Nicolaino, uh, which is a language spoken um, off the coast of western, uh, off the coast of California. It's not still spoken there. It was once upon a time, like 200 years ago, spoken there. Uh, and this is a story um, which is memorialized in the uh, children's book, Island of the Blue Dolphins, which perhaps you've read or heard about at some point. Uh, so just to walk you through the story, it's kind of relevant to our current situation in some ways, but um, there was a group of Nicolaino speakers living on this island who'd basically had no contact with the outside world. One day, uh, there were some Russian sailors who had picked up um, people from the Aleutian Islands, uh, which are up by Alaska, uh, and they decided to just kind of like plop down on the Nicolania Island and take over. Uh, and so there was a battle there in which uh, the Russians and the Aleutians fought against the Nicolania warriors. Most of the Nicolania warriors were killed off. Uh, the Russians and Aleutians didn't really get set up shop there. Uh, but what happened is that there were Catholic missionaries on the California coast who heard about this situation and they felt sorry for the um, Nicolaino speakers. So they went off to the island and they um, decided to bring all of them back over to the mainland where they could sort of be protected amongst the, uh, the walls of the Catholic Church and um, Western civilization there effectively. Uh, that didn't work out um, for a couple of reasons. So one, once they brought those um, as they were leaving the island, they noticed that there was a woman uh, that they had forgotten um, and unfortunately left on the island. Uh, and then they were like, okay, well, we got to come back and get her. I can't remember what the reasons were that they didn't go back immediately and pick her up right away. Uh, and so they left her there. Uh, 
they brought everybody else back to California. Uh, and then within weeks, um, those people passed away because they picked up infectious diseases from the Europeans that they had no um, immunity to, quite sadly. Uh, 18 years passed, they hadn't forgotten about the woman. They eventually went back to see if she was still there, and she was. She lived by herself for 18 years on her own, uh, just being super resourceful uh, and committed to it. And they picked her back up eventually, uh, this is something like 1845, and they were able to, um, well, what happened to her was the exact same thing that happened to everybody else. Um, they picked up first, but within a few weeks, she, she passed away for the same reason as well. Um, linguistically, they were able to record a little bit of her speech, but basically it's her, her story that survived more than anything else, and that's the story of Island of the Blue Dolphins. Um, yeah, so these are not sad situations, or sorry, these are not happy situations, but they happen, right? Uh, so another example of language death is what's called radical language death. Uh, where all the existing speakers of a language just stop speaking it. Um, I've got this little note here about this being called language suicide. That might not be the best way to think about it. So uh, you can think about this with respect to the uh, situation in Canada um, of the residential schools where uh, in the 20th century, um, the European settlers effectively decided that um, what needed to be done with the First Nations communities is to get the kids off of the um, out of the culture and basically try to kill off the culture and in the process kill off the language uh, and sort of assimilate them into um, the uh, European culture that was predominant in Canada at the time. So uh, as part of that, there were harsh penalties imposed on um, these kids who got sent off to these residential schools if they were ever caught speaking their own language. Uh, and with that um, sort of uh, punishment, it seriously demotivated them from speaking their language uh, and in effect um, killed off the language for kind of a whole generation of speakers. Uh, and part of what we're kind of faced with now, um, as anybody who's interested in trying to keep these um, cultures and languages going, is try to figure out how to rejuvenate the language um, once you know it's gone through this process of uh, a whole generation being discouraged from speaking it. Um, so there's also a more common case of gradual language death where the number of speakers slowly declines. Um, and this is more common, like I said, because often what happens is, say, um, children are born into an environment where uh, sort of the language in power or the language more commonly spoken by people around them is not the language that is spoken in their home. So for instance, um, my grandparents, my father's parents, uh, were German speakers living on a farm in Minnesota. My dad never learned German. He just heard his parents speaking it from time to time. He learned English because it was just a much more useful language. Um, German isn't really in danger of dying out at this point in time, um, but that's how languages which don't have as many speakers as German will um, potentially eventually die out um, if the parents just decide, well, it's better for our child to learn um, a more widely spoken language. Um, it gives them more opportunities, right? Uh, so there's also a bottom to the top bottom to top language death. I mentioned this kind of obliquely a little bit ago. Um, this is where language survives in specific contexts. So like I said, um, I believe to this day, the Roman Catholic Church in Rome still uses Latin in all of its um, services. Easter's coming up. I believe the Pope is gonna deliver the mass in Latin. Um, so it still exists as a religious language. And for a long time, Latin existed as a scientific language. Um, so uh, up through like, the 1600s, if you wrote anything in science, you're supposed to write it in Latin because, yeah, the Roman Empire was supposed to be so awesome. Um, the uh, Another example of this, a um, long time ago now, uh, one of the TAs for this course was from Ethiopia, uh, and he uh, natively spoke a language uh, called Amharic, uh, which is a widely spoken language in Ethiopia. Um, but in Ethiopia, there's also a branch of the Christian church there, and um, they don't speak Amharic in that church. Um, they speak a language called Ge'ez. Uh, so that's only used in that sort of liturgical context and they never speak it elsewhere. Um, yeah, so that's bottom to top language death where it's not spoken in sort of normal situations in life, but just really specific ones, um, it survives. So in the present day, many languages are in danger of dying out. Uh, there's approximately 6,000 or so languages spoken in the world. Um, I've got this uh, link here to the Ethnologue website, which is pretty fun. I'll show it to you here briefly. Um, 
this is a language or a website which uh, can give you information about any of the languages of the world. Uh, they always have a random language uh, selected for their front page. So this one is about Chin Matu, which is the language of Myanmar, spoken by 30,000 people. Uh, and I never heard about it before, but if you want to, you can click on this and find out a little bit more about it. Uh, it just gives you kind of some basic information. Um, in the modern day, you can get lots of great information about languages on Wikipedia too, but this one has all the languages that we know about. Um, so you can check that out if you enjoy learning more about that. Um, we can look at the distribution of languages as they're currently spoken in the world. Um, and we often think about, um, from a North American perspective, um, where uh, English is pretty predominant and you know you also get um, a large percentage of French speakers in Canada, maybe a large percentage of Spanish speakers in the US, that sort of thing. Uh, we look to Europe with all its various different countries and think, well, there's a lot more languages there or you have to learn languages to get around. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, Europe doesn't have that many of the world's languages. It only has about 4%. Uh, if you count all of the um, indigenous American languages in the Americas, North and South, that gives you 15% of the world's languages. 31% are in Africa. Uh, and basically about half of the world's languages are in um, Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and a good chunk of these are in um, the Pacific Islands, like Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, are two good examples where there's lots of people uh, and they often live kind of isolated from each other um, for uh, because the islands are isolated from each other and there's many of them. Or Papua New Guinea is an example where um, there's lots of different valleys in the highlands of the um, uh, island of New Guinea and it's hard to get around from one place to the next. Uh, so uh, if people get kind of isolated in smaller groups of people, they tend to develop their own language, their own culture, that sort of thing. Uh, so if you're just simply counting, that's why you get so many uh, in an environment like say um, the South Pacific. Uh, languages with less than 20,000 speakers can be technically considered endangered, but it also kind of depends on the vector of how many speakers are, um, new speakers are coming into the language or old speakers are going away. So uh, you can also note um, an example of Breton, which is also a um, Celtic language uh, spoken in France, in Northwest France. I just realized I said Cornish was a Gaelic language before, but Cornish is a Celtic language. So the Celtic languages traditionally were spoken in kind of the far northwestern corner of um, Europe. So like Irish Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, Cornish, Breton, um, all in that little corner. There were um, Celtic languages that were related to one another and then they've uh, slowly over time kind of gotten replaced as um, Germanic languages and also French have moved into that uh, region of the world. So a hundred years ago or more, um, one and a half million speakers spoke Breton and there were fewer people in France back then. So that's kind of a higher percentage of um, the French were speaking this language. Now there's about a quarter million. So it's kind of going in a direction which is a bit worrisome. Um, languages can become endangered because of government policies. So I can't remember for sure if this is the case in Breton, but as an example, you might think of if the government in control of an area just says, well, uh, we're not going to teach in Breton anymore in this particular region, um, then that language can become endangered, right? Uh, this may be the opposite of the case of what is, you know, the policy in um, Quebec, but if, say, the Canadian government were supposed to, were going to say, well, all um, language instruction in Quebec uh, has to be taught in English, uh, at this point in time from here on out, then Quebec, Quebecois French might become more of an endangered uh, variety of the French language. As we know, uh, the language policy in Quebec is kind of the opposite of that, in part to kind of help uh, sustain the existence of um, Quebecois French um, and the culture um, moving forward. So uh, another reason that languages can become endangered um, depend on the extent to which the language is used at home. If parents decide not to speak it to their kids, the kids aren't gonna acquire it. Um, in the same way as they would otherwise. Economic motivations, like I said, usually you have more opportunities speaking a language which is more widely spoken around you than speaking some unique language that your parents might speak. Uh, and so this leads to a decline in the number of younger speakers while the older speakers just keep getting older. Um, so the rich get richer. So nine major languages are the native languages of over 40% of the world's population. I've got the top 10 listed out here. Uh, and to a great extent, these are languages of um, what used to be uh, colonial European powers like English or Spanish or Portuguese, so on and so forth. Uh, and there's also examples of languages from heavily populated places like uh, two Chinese languages here, Mandarin and Wu and uh, Bengali and Hindi from India. Uh, so 
That's why they cover sort of so much of the globe. Um, Four percent of the world's languages are spoken by 96 percent of the world's populations. Uh, so 240 languages cover almost everybody. Uh, and then everybody else um, gets a smaller piece of the pie. So 52% of languages are spoken by fewer than 10,000 people, and 50% of languages are not being transmitted to children. And in particular, um, languages like the ones we find in Australia or um, what are called Amerindian languages, so uh, indigenous languages of the America, uh, these languages are expected to be lost in this century. Um, yeah, in part because of the um, historical reasons I was mentioning before, say, uh, with respect to uh, things like the residential school history in Canada and other countries. Um, so how do linguists get involved with this? So many linguists attempt to stem the tide of language death. Uh, and how do we do this exactly? Because it's not easy. So uh, one thing um, we can attempt to do is to disseminate grammatical information on dead or near dead languages. So uh, it's a totally different ball game if you're a native language of this native speaker of a language like this and somebody who's not a native speaker of the language because uh, you have a much richer knowledge of a language if you're a native speaker if you've known how to speak it from birth. Um, so one thing linguists want to do is kind of preserve as much of that knowledge as possible from native speakers before they're gone. Uh, in part, they can develop instructional texts and educational programs. Um, one of our professors, Darren Flynn, works a lot on sort of teaching um, speakers of um, indigenous languages in the area how to teach their language to uh, people who want to learn it. Uh, we can also help um, speakers develop technical vocabulary uh, that doesn't exist traditionally in their language or make recordings of the language in use. Uh, another thing that Darren likes to do is uh, create songs like rap songs in um, indigenous languages, uh, which are kind of more appealing. Um, for kids who might be interested in uh, acquiring the language. Uh, 